But to, to begin this morning, the, the message time, I, I want to start by showing you a four-minute thank you video from Agape International Missions. Um, Agape International Missions, or AIM, is one of the signature ministries that we support here at Grace. Um, we support about 12 different mission organizations. Some of them are local, some are international. One of them is AIM. And AIM exists to obliterate human trafficking. Their, their objective is to fight until there is no more trafficking happening in the world. And, and it's a lofty dream. It's a cause worth pursuing. And this is a thank you video from some of their staff and their departments. And we support them out of our church missions budget, but a lot of us personally support them as well. In fact, um, we, we were the very first church to join their church sponsorship program. So we were actually the first church to sign up to support AIM, and they have just taken off. They, they're exploding. They're, they're doing so well. But I want you to hear the thank you, and then this is actually the intro to the direction I want to take us for the message today. So um, roll the video, play it loud, four minutes long. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah and I'm our Director of Restoration here in Cambodia. I just wanted to say a massive thank you to all of our donors and to everyone who gave in 2021 to AIM. It has sustained us through a very difficult year in Cambodia um, and for the whole world. There have been many challenges that we've faced in restoration. We've struggled for our social workers to be able to see their reintegrated clients. We've had difficulties um, in helping the families of some of our girls. There have been so many challenges that we've faced and to get any rhythm and schedule in our home. But uh, through all of that, there's been such hope and so much good that God has done in that time. And we're just so thankful. We've had girls that have transitioned from ARC to our transitional home. That home is half full right now. And those girls are uh, starting back at work soon and getting back into their um, daily lives and transitioning back into their communities. And we've gotten to reintegrate some girls and we've just seen God do so many great things in restoration um, and in our girls, even though it's been such a difficult year. So thank you everyone for all you've done. We really appreciate it. The year has been, it's been a kind of awkward one, I guess, because of COVID. It uh, started off very well. Uh, January was a good month, had a lot of rescues. We had a lot of, um, a lot of arrests, the traffickers. I and mean, then February was when COVID really hit. So um, big operations closed down for a few months. Um, and so we switched to doing um, smaller trafficking cases. It has been a tough year, but we've come through it quite well. I think the team have done really well. They've stuck at it despite um, the frustrations. The legal team have worked throughout the year, really. It's not stopped for them. The courts have been open. A lot of good convictions um, helped a lot of people get justice, which has been good. And just like I say thank you all to our donors and supporters again. Um, we all do appreciate it. I can tell you that there have been many challenges in 2021 related to COVID, but we've seen God working through each and every one of them. For one, ATC, it has been closed since mid-February. However, we're so thankful that God provided AIM through generous donations to pay all salaries at 100%. Another area that we've really more specifically seen God working, at least in, in, on a daily basis, has been in the complete transformation of our ATC1 training center. We have been remodeling this building for the last eight to 10 months and effectively doubling the capacity of how many women we can serve inside of this space. To be able to see a person when they walk in the door for the first time and to see that person evolve in their faith, evolve in their ability to handle life, to evolve in the skills that they're learning, who we've seen go through that transformative process. And it really is inspiring, it's humbling, and it's a thrill to be a part of that on a daily basis. I'm honored to do it. You know, as the pandemic COVID-19 has been hitting hard, around the globe, especially Cambodia here. Although the school closed, but the program is still running. So we provide online education to uh, the student. You know, the community that we serve through the church, we, we have to find a new way to work and serve. But gratefully and thank God to donor, to supporter, to partner, to leader that have allowed them to create you know, a humanitarian aid program so that the church in here in Swipe 
running this program to help people who are in need. That is really, I see God love through our team member as well and extended love to the community and how community experience God love during this hard time. Let's open our Bibles, 2 Samuel chapter 5. I love the opening scene from this video. Um, I, I visited AIM at that exact spot a few years ago. And, and those same streets that you saw in the very opening scene of the video where kids are riding scooters and there's bicycles, those same streets just a few years ago were unpaved. They were filled with potholes and they would flood every time it rained. And in the not too distant past, that exact neighborhood that we're watching on this video was a place where almost 100% of the girls were trafficked. And I know that's hard to believe, a statistic like that, but, but almost every single young girl or woman in that town was sold on a regular basis for sex. It was so unsafe that women from the ministry weren't allowed to walk around by themselves. And, and yet through Ames' efforts... And through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, through people in Svaipak, in Cambodia, there has been such a complete reversal. The paved streets are like a prophetic picture of the restoration that's happened. And children are literally rollerblading and riding scooters down streets where they used to be trafficked. Uh, AIM had a a very small second-hand gym, they called it the Lord's Gym, that they used as an outreach for uh, pimps and traffickers. And they would try and draw these guys into conversations and Bible studies. But as the ministry has grown, they have been able to build a full-on uh, training center. In fact, I might show you that video at some point. This training center now is being coached and led by a famous former Muay Thai champion from Cambodia. Don and Bridget Brewster, who, who are the founders of AIM, the presidents of AIM, they live in an apartment, and I have been in their apartment, I have visited with them. They live in an upper floor of an apartment building, and the building used to be a hotel for out-of-country tourists that were coming to that town to buy little girls for sex. It was built as a hotel. Nobody goes to this town for vacation. Foreigners only come to this town for one reason. It was built, and it was also a, a functioning brothel. And now the presidents of Agape International Mission live on the top floor, and the whole building has been repurposed and is used for rescuing girls. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. We, we, we know that... that there was a brothel that AIM shut down, arrested traffickers, prosecuted them, rescued girls, shut it down, bought the building, and inside that building, there was one room that was particularly sinister. It was called the Pink Room, and this was a room deep inside the brothel where the youngest of the underage virgins were sold, and AIM bought the building and repurposed it, and that spot is now a place where rescue efforts for women get launched around the world. That is the kingdom of God. Amen. When the kingdom and when the reality of God gets established in a place, damaged and traumatized pasts have to bend the knee to glorious potential-filled futures. It happens everywhere. The kingdom of God gets established through the church based on Jesus in the world. And it also happened in King David's life. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, David has been ruling over a portion of the nation of Israel and has finally been inaugurated as the king of the entire country. 
So David is, it has been inaugurated over the entire country, and I want to read what happens next, and then I'll introduce today's installment of our Down and Out series that we've been doing here at Grace Church. But in, in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 4, it says, David was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. The king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who lived there. You know, I don't hear a lot of people talk about this when we talk about King Saul, David's predecessor, and David. But the whole time that Saul was king of Israel, and 1 Samuel 13 tells us that was about 42 years, the whole time he was king, there were enemy Jebusites, historic enemies of Israel, entrenched in Jerusalem. And Saul never wiped them out. These were enemies of God's people, and they were embedded. And in fact, they were so entrenched, so embedded, that not only did Saul never drive them out, they never thought they could be driven out. Um, Listen to how the Jebusites respond to David when he marches on them. Middle of verse 6, the Jebusites said to David, you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off because they thought David cannot get in here. Do, 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 you, do you hear that confidence? Good luck, David. No one has ever been able to get rid of us. We are so established that an army of paralyzed soldiers could stop you from driving us out. Um, we are not going anywhere. (laughs) Have any of the issues in your life ever talked to you that way? Good luck getting rid of me. I've been around a long time. I'm not going anywhere. You have always struggled with me. Um, And by the way, your dad struggled with me. And his dad before him struggled with me. In fact, I'm a family curse. And I've been in this town a lot longer than you. Yeah, I know you've had moments of freedom. I know you've had little seasons where you had a little room to run, but I always come back. You will never get free of me. Um, Have you ever heard those voices? And have those voices ever been telling you the truth? Have you had issues that you haven't been able to get rid of? Have you had issues that you haven't been able to overcome? Look at verse 7. I love this verse. It starts out with such a beautiful word. Verse 7 starts out with the word, nevertheless. I love this word, despite the strength and the history and the deep entrenchment of the Jebusites. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion. Everybody needs a good nevertheless moment in their story. Everybody needs a moment where where, where they can say, it looked like it was going one way, but nevertheless, God lifted me out of that place and took me a different direction. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, which is the city of David. I I like that. The the Jebusite stronghold, the, the stronghold that Saul couldn't wipe out, The stronghold that had been around for generations actually became the city of David. The the city of David, when you read this in his story, by the way, the city of David, um, that's different from Bethlehem. The city of David uh, referred to um, David's palace in Jerusalem. They called his palace the city of David. It's about the size of one small city block. And that's the place where he reigned as king over the entire country for 33 years. That's like Don and Bridget, the, 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 the determined abolitionists living in an apartment that used to be used to house abusers. That's, that's like AIM demolishing the pink room and setting up an administrative 
headquarters. That it's like you. Overcoming your hurts and your issues and then ministering to other people out of that deep place. This is the story that you have been born into. Uh, in, the, in the Two Towers, the hobbit Sam Gamgee says to Frodo, I wonder what sort of a tale we've fallen into. That sort of a tale, Sam. That is Christianity. This is your story. As followers of Jesus, this is your DNA. The reason you want to weep when you hear the stories, the reason it stirs you at your core is because this is who you are. And I want to talk to you for just a few minutes today about your cause. Your cause. This is the fifth installment of our Down and Out series. We'll wrap this up here in a week or two. Um, Donald Rucker is going to preach next Sunday, by the way, and so I don't know if he's going to continue or or go crazy in some other direction. But um, I'll be here, but Donald is speaking. When God comes down and touches a human life, it automatically triggers an outward movement. When God really comes down and touches somebody, it always produces an outward movement. So the Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost, and the church went out from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. Um, The the Spirit comes down and people move out from their sins or their moral prisons. The the Spirit comes down and people are compelled to go out and find someone to serve. If there's no outward push, we have to question how much we've received of God's downward um, movement in our lives. And so in this Down and Out series, we've talked about four outward responses that we want to make in in, um, response to God's movement in our lives. We've covered four, and I'll give you the fifth today. So number one, just, just as a reminder, here's what we've covered. We've said, in response to God's downward movement in our lives, number one, we're going to pray the 210. Number two, we're going to pastor our measure. Number three, we're going to reach our one. Number four, we're going to serve our eight to 15. And if you missed any of these messages, please, this is part of the heart and soul of our church. This is part of our ethos. So if you missed these sermons, catch up on these. Isaiah preached on our eight to 15, and it was so good. But then number five, we're going to champion our cause. So I want to tell you three things today, simple message. I want to tell you three things about your cause. Number one, you have a cause. Number two, your cause will cost you greatly. And number three, if God really has his way in our lives, you will eventually become your cause. And by the way, some of the greatest moments of God's abundant life that you could ever touch will be found around your cause. Uh, But number one, you have a cause. Um, Go with me real quickly to Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1. Um, There is a cause in this world that you have been uniquely shaped and designed to meet. In Isaiah chapter 49, verse 1, there's a prophecy given about Israel But it also applies to us because this is how God works in all of us. In Isaiah 49, verse 1, it says, Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. You have been shaped and sharpened and polished and poised and prepared for a cause too. And often, um, not always, but quite often, your cause grows out of either your identity as a child, 
or your deepest pains and struggles. Um, it, it seems to me, just from my own life and my observations of people, that the healthier we get in adulthood, the more we become like our true, unspoiled child self. See, see, there's a you that you were before people's bad decisions, before your bad decisions, before people's mistakes or sins or calamities or abusive tendencies happen to you. There's a you that you were created to be. And before that you got harmed, that there, there, were, there were hints of the cause that you were shaped to fulfill. And it seems like the longer we walk with Jesus, and if we really let him work in us, he restores the child us. And the older I get, the more I'm actually becoming like the young me. Um, as a child, you looked like your purpose. And, and, and we see this in Jesus too, by the way. You know, we don't know very much about Jesus as a child, there's so many things that I wish the Bible told us. Remember, the Bible tells us everything we need to know, but not everything that we want to know. We were, I was in a conversation last night. We were talking about angels, and we were all wishing we knew more about angels. The Bible tells us what we need to know, not what we always want to know. But the Bible does tell us one thing about Jesus. Listen to this verse in Luke 2.49. That there's only one quote from Jesus when he was a child in the Bible. And it says this, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Or another translation said, don't you know I have to be about my father's business? As a child, he already looked like what he was created uh, on earth to do. See, before I got all self-centered and twisted up in sin, which happened, <laughs> it happened late in high school, early in college, before that happened in me, I looked like my calling. Like very early on in high school, I got voted by my classmates as a natural helper. I don't know if we still have that in school today, but natural helpers back then, the students voted on other kids that they were most apt to talk to if they had a crisis in their life. And so I got voted a natural helper, and I went on a little retreat, and they taught me how to do peer counseling, and there was actually a year in high school where I had regular meetings with the school counselor to process the counsel I was giving to kids who were talking to me. Now, now I, I, I warped from that. I had some rough years where I was not, I didn't look like my calling, and I got very wrapped up in myself and things I shouldn't have been. But, but um, for, for a lot of us, that, that unspoiled childhood, you looked like your calling. It looked like your cause. And also, it seems that for a lot of us, our greatest causes grow out of our greatest struggles and hurts. You know, most people don't develop a, a, a passionate cause for something unless they've experienced the trauma of that thing. You know, trauma can either cripple us or pull the champion out of us. And a lot of times it does a combination of both. Um, people who had to battle addiction become champions for recovery. People who have lived through deep loss and pain and trauma have a heart to lift other people out of loss and sorrow. People who have been crushed by life support, uh, start support groups, whether they're formal or informal. Um, people who were deeply lost in life before meeting Jesus have a passion for destiny and helping other people encounter their destiny. So what, what, what are your deepest hurts? What, what are some of your deepest struggles? Um, what shape do the Jebusites take in your life? Um, th those might be indicators of the cause that God is calling you to contend for. Um, and by the way, can I give a really strong word of caution here? Um, since our cause often grows out of our deepest struggle, we have to be really careful to guard our struggles, to guard our, against the sins that pull on us and the, the struggles in our life. Um, if your cause grows out of your struggle, uh, sometimes we see people fall in the very area that they're championing against. And when that happens, we almost always sit back and think, 
what a hypocrite. And sometimes they are hypocrites, but sometimes they're not hypocrites at all. Sometimes they are so genuine. It's just their cause has grown out of their struggle, and they haven't quite gone deep enough in bringing healing to that area of struggle. So we have to be so careful as we champion our cause. We have to stay in the process of God healing and cleansing and restoring us on the inside. But you have a cause. That's number one. Two more quickly. Number two, your cause will cost you greatly. Now, it's okay because the, it's worth it. But, but there's a price tag associated to our cause. Anybody who would live a great life has to pay a great price along the way. Um, back, back in 2 Samuel chapter 5, um, it says, Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion. But then verse 8 tells us that it wasn't easy. Verse 8 says, On that day, David had said, Anyone who conquers the Jebusites will have to use the water shaft to reach them. And the water shaft was the sewer. Nobody could overthrow the Jebusites because nobody wanted to crawl through the sewer to fight them. But have you noticed that, that sewer scenes are pretty common in action films? Have you noticed that? The superhero always has to crawl through a sewer. Whether it's Jean Valjean carrying a sleeping Marius through the sewers of Paris or, or Jean-Claude Van Damme in Cyborg where he's doing the splits above the sewers holding his sword. <laughs> but there's always a sewer scene. There's always a scene where the hero has to crawl through something horrible and nasty to get to the prize. See, most causes sound romantic on the surface. We're going to fight to end global poverty. It's romantic. It's romantic. And it is. But, but, but when you get up, and, up close and personal with a, with a cause, there's always an ugly battle. There's always a fight. Whether it's an issue in your life you're trying to overcome or an injustice out there that you're trying to overcome, um, your cause will cost you greatly. In fact, Jesus wept blood in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying about his cause. Listen to his prayer in, in Luke Chapter 22, verse 42. His cause was so overwhelming that Jesus prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And then it says, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And then being in anguish, even after an angel has strengthened him, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus sweated drops of blood when the weight of his cause was rested on him. But, but listen to this. This is so awesome. In Revelation 5, 9, heaven is worshiping Jesus. And in one of the songs, they sing these words, Revelation 5, 9. They sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. Because you were slain, and with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. The very life that was pressed out of him became the ransom payment for people in the world who needed to be rescued and redeemed. Your cause will do the same with you. The price that you pay to stay faithful and in love with Jesus and deal with your stuff and serve the world will prove redemptive. And, and, and real quickly, let me just mention, the significance of your cause is not determined by the size of your cause. It doesn't have to be a global initiative to be a worthwhile cause. Your cause might sound as simple as, I am going to be there for my grandchildren. I'm going to raise these boys well. I'm going to show up for those 22 kindergartners in my classroom. I'm going to do my job to the glory of God. That is a cause worth living for. I'm going to love my loved ones like they've never been loved before. Or, or your cause might sound bigger. I'm going to fight to end trafficking. I'm going to fight to end poverty. It breaks my heart. And, and so if that's your cause, what do you do? Well, you start small. You support a child through world vision. You read World Vision's updates and you pray for them. You sign up to sponsor people from AIM. You give them money. You pray. You let your heart ache. You stay informed. It's part of how we contend for a cause. 
um, you do have a cause. Nobody here is disqualified from having a cause. It will cost you greatly. But then number three, um, if God really has his way in you, you will eventually become your cause. So let me just read one more passage as the worship team rejoins me. Let me read to you from Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Listen to several verses here. Brilliant scripture passage. God is speaking, and he says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. All who rage against you will surely be ashamed and disgraced. Those who oppose you will be as nothing and will perish. Though you search for your enemies, you will not find them. Those who wage war against you will be as nothing at all. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and who says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, you worm, Jacob. <laughs> Little Israel, don't be afraid. I love this verse. The Bible is so deep. The Bible is so rich. It's almost like wherever you put down your shovel, you're going to strike oil or gold or something if, if you stick with it. The, you know what the word worm means? Where it says, don't be afraid, you worm, Jacob, in verse 14. Um, that, that, that word refers to something red. The, the color red. It refers to a scarlet-covered grub or worm. And so I know that sounds so strange, but think about it this way. God is saying, don't be afraid, scarlet-covered humanity. When I look at you and the Jebusites that you battle and the things you fight with, I look at you through the prism and through the lens of what Jesus poured out for you on the cross. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. Don't fear. I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And then here's point number three. See, I will make you into a threshing sledge. Remember when the disciples came to Jesus, he said, follow me and I will make you something. I will make you fishers of men. I will make you into a threshing sledge, new and sharp with many teeth. You will thresh the mountains and crush them. You will reduce the hills to chaff. You will winnow them, and the wind will pick them up. A gale will blow them away, but you will rejoice in the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. See, it's great to have a cause. It's great to support a cause, but the ultimate goal is for us to become synonymous with our cause. See, you can't think of Don and Bridget without thinking of AIM. You can't think of Mother Teresa without thinking of the countless poor people around the world that she served. When people think of this church, I want them to immediately associate it with the grace of God. When somebody thinks about me, I hope there's a hint of also thinking about Jesus and the kingdom of God and the church. Listen, this year, 2022, let's invade the Jebusites. Let's make this a year where we say, no matter how much we've tried in the past, this is the year where I'm going to chase that nevertheless from God. This is the year where we're going to set up an entirely different shop in this place. Let's make this a year of deeper repentance, deeper cleansing, deeper humility, deeper forgiveness, deeper inner healing, deeper contending, stronger giving, making a greater difference in the world around us. Let's identify our cause. Let's pay the price for our cause and let's become synonymous with the cause that God's calling us to. Amen.